Today's review is of The Violence Inside Us, A Brief History of an Ongoing American Tragedy by Chris Murphy. According to Time Magazine, The Violence Inside Us offers a nuanced exploration of the history of violence in America, the driving forces behind the country's fascination with firearms, and why so many American citizens are impacted by gun violence. Our presenter today is Mark T. Henderson. He served 34 and a half years in law enforcement, retiring in 2019 as the Brighton Chief of Police. He is currently the Director of Community Security for the Jewish Federation of Greater Rochester. Mark has a BA in Criminal Justice from Albany University and a Master of Science degree in Justice and Security Administration from the University of Phoenix. He attended the FBI National Academy Session 221 and Session 77 of the FBI LEADS program. Please join me in welcoming Mark Henderson to our podium. Thank you. Am I going too fast for anybody? I uh, <laughs> recently had surgery. Are we good on the, the volume? And I, I've become accustomed with this. And I'm using it less and less. And I've graduated to slip-on sneakers with the help of a, an elevated thing. So I'm ready, really. Today's my third week, and it's my really first time getting out to talk about and being, being with people. So. Uh, I look forward to today. So I used to be an adjunct, adjunct instructor at Finger Lakes Community College. And I would ask this question of my students before I would start a lecture. How many people read the book? So I, I have a story for you. In ninth grade, my English teacher assigned me the Great Gatsby to do as a book report. So I chose the easy way out. I took the jacket cover and then proceeded to stand and talk for 15, 20 minutes, and she let me keep going and going and going, and finally said, Mark, next time read the book. <laughs> so I did read the book. I had no idea who Chris Murphy was. No idea. I, because I've been kind of incapacitated, I've gone online, I've watched his videos, so I'm going to bring a different perspective. Um, part of my bio talked about my new job. My previous job, there's some familiar faces here, and I think I can uh, take off my mask. I am vaccinated and I'm, I'm away. Um, some familiar faces, uh, you know, I, I interacted as the Brighton police chief. I was responsible for a community at night of 36,000 people and during the day of 100,000 people. And uh, pretty much all roads, all major roads ran through Brighton. So from a public perspe uh, safety perspective, that was my job. My new job focuses on a community that has 25 locations. They have a population in the greater Rochester area of over 18,000. At one time, it was almost twice that. And unfortunately, the Jewish community has been the focus of not only anti-Semitic tropes, caricatures, but violent activity. And uh, I would interact as the police chief. Uh, there's a large footprint of the Jewish community in the town of Brighton. And you know, every rabbi had my, my cell phone and I had every rabbi's cell phone. And uh, the Tree of Life tragedy, uh, when it was uh, happening, it happened at a conservative shul. And for those not familiar with the Jewish faith, a conservative or orth orthodox practicing Jewish member does not use mechanical means on the Sabbath. And that it was on a Saturday, it was on the Sabbath. Uh, Tree of Life was a conservative shul. And so I was getting phone calls from law enforcement, I was getting phone calls from the FBI, I was getting phone calls from the state police. We need to put a, a visible format, footprint out. So we did that, I was getting uh, phone calls from the leadership in the Jewish community. And then I didn't hear from the Orthodox community until sunset, and it really rattled the community. So. The next day, we, we met, uh, myself uh, and other executives in law enforcement, met at the Federation and talked about where we go from here, looking at security footprints, looking at you know, measures that can be taken to ensure a deg degree of safety at, at a house of worship. In Chris Murphy's book, he talks about the need for protecting houses of worship. He talked about the need for protecting schools. And why is that? Is it, is it because we are an outlier in our violence, well, he, he makes an argument for that. So as the, 
And as it became 34 years in law enforcement, I decided maybe, you know, I saw a job posting from the Federation. Um, I applied for the job. It's affiliated with a national organization called Secure Community Network. I flew to Chicago, met the director of the, age, the, the organization, and the focus is strictly on the Jewish community and what measures we can do from a safety perspective. And a lot of what I read in Senator Murphy's book, we're doing now, right? Access control. When you came to the library today, you had access control. You went past security. Because of COVID, you had pre-registration. These are all methods that we try to instill in our locations from a safety and security perspective. And if, unfortunately, the safety and security pers uh, pers perspectives do not work or, or policies do not work, we have to be able to counter active threats. So I'm a, a certified instructor in active shooter response. I'm a, a certified instructor in countering the active threat, right? Together we could do this, right? If something were to come to this location right now, together we can fortify this room. We may not be able to get out of here. So I teach that to members of, of, of uh, synagogues. I teach that to uh, uh, community members. And then I also teach Stop the Bleed. Because there's a realization that no matter what great safe, safety measure you put in place, somebody could defeat that. And that's what happened in Sandy Hook. That principle in Sandy Hook took target hardening to the highest level. So part of my, my uh, interaction with the FBI, they're kind of professional finishing schools. And when I was uh, at the FBI Academy in session 221 in 2005, they had a group of, of FBI agents that were looking at the shooters. And so they taught our class, right? And then there was a whole new wave of active shooters. And then the LEADS program, it was 30 law enforcement executives from across the country that were invited to this seminar. The first week we did at the Quantico at, at the Academy, and then the second week we did at Charlottesville. We were in Charlottesville on the first anniversary, the week of the first anniversary of the alt-right protests, whatever you want to call it. And we, we stood on the steps and we talked about the different measures we would now have to do differently in law enforcement that we did when I started in 1985. I also picked up on a clue in the class. A majority of my classmates were police chiefs or sheriffs in organizations that had active shooter incidents in their jurisdiction. In this book, the senator talks about San Bernardino, California. That chief that sat at my table was the commanding officer of that incident. 14 people were killed that day, multiple sites. It started out as a workplace violence and it escalated to a community violence. And he talked about his efforts. I believe I was invited to this class because it was at the same time the JCC of Rochester, amongst other Jewish community centers, had bomb threats called in. And we made the national news on that. The second bomb threat, everything was resolved. My wife and I went uh, uh, on vacation. I'm sitting near the ocean. And up pops the, the, the national news with a Brighton police car and an officer standing out telling people they can't get in, talking about the ongoing threat to the Jewish community, these bomb threats, and what's happening. So this new job, I focus on the Jewish community. I work with any community member that wants to talk about this, this aspect. I'm no longer in public law enforcement, but you know, I, if there's anything I can do, if there's an organization that may be interested in what I'm talking about, I'm happy to do that. So what I like to do is leave a lot of time for questions, and I like an interactive way. If not, I'll call on you. So, so let's talk about Sandy Hook. So the principle of Sandy Hook, now think back. This was at not where we are with the number of active shooters we were. There were school shootings, Paducah, Kentucky. That chief was in my class, right? So this school principal in Connecticut took controlled access to the highest level, right? I have one of our elementary schools, we use the footprint for Sandy Hook. You have uh, an entryway, it's called a man trap, where somebody can get in it, there's a second la layer of an, a, a locked door, 
Um, and that principal advocated for locks on doors in the classroom and different things and met with security committees. That was pre-mass shooting. And that was pre-Adam Lanza. In the book, Senator Murphy, then Congressman Murphy, right? He was a congressman whose district included the town of Newtown, which included Sandy Hook. And on that Friday afternoon, Senator Murphy talks about this, this is personal to him. He responded to the fire station. He saw the family members that were reunited. He saw family members that got the information that there would be no reunification, that their, their child, their loved one, and it wasn't just children that died. There were 20 children, and I need to walk really fast back here. 20 first graders and six educators. Oh, does it hit home to me? My daughter's an elementary school teacher. My granddaughter is in first grade. So as it was personal to Senator Murphy, it was very personal to me. I'm a little police chief here in Brighton. On a Friday afternoon, I always looked as Fridays as my get things done in the morning, do my, instead of doing Monday and setting the tone with a, a senior staff meeting, I did it on Friday mornings. Some would say to ruin the weekends. I just figured it would be easier that way. And I'm sitting at my desk and the phone rings. And on the other line was a person that was obviously crying. And she asked me this question. Are my children safe at the Council Rock School? Now, the Council Rock School is an elementary school in the town of Brighton. And I, I had no idea what was going on. I was actually working that day and not perusing the internet. And for the next hour, we talked about safety and security protocols at our schools. I talked to mother through the process of grieving, and it was not her child. And then the school started to get involved, and then we, we hung up. So yes, Sandy Hook is personal to the author. Sandy Hook is personal to me. So you heard what I do, heard what I did. I did read the book. I said yes before I had any idea what this was about. Now, I've done that before. For those that have gone to the Brighton Library, a uh, very nice same type organization person came into my office and handed me a book. And I said, Osage Indians, what's this about? And she said, well, it's about the Osage Indians in Oklahoma. And you might want to read this. And I'll tell you, I learned a lot about a chapter in history I never knew about. So when I looked at this book, I was heading to Israel on a work trip, 13-hour flight, bought a brand new iPad, downloaded it, and I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll talk about violence. You know, part of my undergrad dealt with studies and part of what I, what I taught at the community college level talked about criminology and different things. Started to read this. This book's about gun control. And I was gonna ask the question, am I being set up, right? Cops. Cops are associated with guns. Well, for everyone here, I'm not a gun person. I'm a, an administrator that looks at things from a safety perspective. So I started to read the book. I started to see what he was making points about, right? We are the most violent country in the prosperous world. That term he used was pros prosperous. He used the outlier terminology. I think we all can agree it's pretty violent right now, right? We can also agree that it may be very violent here in and around the city of Rochester. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Why all of a sudden now do we have an increase in violence? Or has it always been this way? At the start of the book, the author talks about a young man. Well, it starts with the father of the young man. It's, you know, it's, the same, it's a parallel to what he was talking about, Sandy Hook. At the time, same time Sandy Hook was happening, there was an incident where a young man, a prosperous young man, was going to collect on a debt for fixing a car. Went to an area, some comments were made. It ended with one of the individuals going to a car, getting an illegally possessed in a handgun, shot the young man, and the man ultimately succumbed to his injuries. Now, I'm gonna use this term. There was a period of time that I recall grievances, grudges, 
disputes being settled with fists, right? Still violent, but the outcomes were a lot less lethal than that of a handgun. And the shooter in this particular incident made the comment, things just escalated way too fast, got out of hand, and I didn't mean to kill him. A little bit more about the author. So who's Chris Murphy? He's a senator, Democratic senator from Connecticut. He was a Democratic congressional. Not that political affiliation at all should matter. Again, so I didn't know who, who he was. So I started to learn more about him. At the, the Pulse nightclub club mass ma massacre down in Orlando, Florida, I used lessons learned from that in my presentation on countering active threats. The Las Vegas shooting incident, I used those. From the point of high, the, the person that had the gun had, had advantage, it was a military grade weapon, and was shooting down. And I talk about how do you protect yourself from that? Cover concealment, actual cover that'll stop a bullet. I used the Tree of Life example, and I used the Sandy Hook in my presentations. When I'm, so we have a, a day school, it's an elementary school, and when I talk to te teachers there, I talk about a duty and an obligation. Everybody's heard of run, hide, fight. Well, if you're a teacher, a first grade teacher, you can't run. You have a legal, now let's not talk about moral or ethical, let's talk about the legal obligation you have to those children. If you can't take them all, you have to protect your students. So Murphy talks about what moved him in Orlando. Now a relatively junior senator from Connecticut. He gets mad. And for the next 15 hours, he filibustered on the floor of the Senate. And he was demanding congressional change, gun control change. And his advocates, his friends, Corey, Senator Corey from New Jersey, stood with him. Some of the leadership applauded his effort, but basically told him, you're really not going to get anything accomplished. And some of the opposing leadership kind of applauded his effort, but at the conclusion of his filibuster, there was no change in some of the laws that need to be changed, in my opinion. And that, that, that's meant to be an enticement, so you read the book. That's what I did with my students. He talked, in his book, he talks about waves of violence in the history of America, waves of violence, right? He talked about slavery, Jim Crow laws. He talked about violence perpetuated by the police. He talked about violence as it relates to weaponry. And as more and more guns were sold, and the techn technological advances of a gun, more bullets, faster, led to more of a wave of violence. And then there was a period of time that these guns that were manufactured for military areas, right? We, we've been a country at war for a very long period of time. And then, you know, there's a lot of debate now, and I'm not, I'm not gonna get into that debate, but at the same time, that technological advances applied to the war, theater of war but it came back to our communities. There was a period of time, 10 year period of time, in the 90s, where there was a ban on assault weapons. And do you know what happened during that 10 year period of time? There were no school shootings. You know, there was something called the NICS check, National Instant Criminal Background Check System, NICS, I'm familiar with NICS because anytime we would find a handgun, we would recover a handgun, you would run it through a NICS system. You'd run the individual through the NICS system. But that expired. It expired on September 13, 2004. There are some aspects of the NICS still, still in play. And because we live in New York, we do have some gun control laws that other states don't have. And let's just say occasionally you may go out for breakfast with a bunch of retired older generation cops and they may not agree with the New York State 
laws right now, you know, in particular the SAFE Act, you know, the SAFE Act that limits ammunition capacity, the SAFE Act that limits ownership of high capacity rifles. So how are we getting high capacity rifles in New York State? Because people can go to other states. They can go to Ohio. They can go down south. They can end up in Florida and purchase a gun. If, if a state has a waiting period, a private transaction does not. You know, as, as we talk about what we can do to change things later on, maybe that's a, a, a transaction that needs to be limited. Senator Murphy's trying to look at some of the root causes of violence. What's, uh, here's a direct quote. Murphy makes the case that violence most closely tracks income and poverty. He states you are more likely to be the victim of a homicide, you are more likely to be killed by your husband, and you're more likely to kill yourself if you are poor. So he talks about poverty, he talks about suicide, and he talks about domestic violence. You know, these three things associated with a handgun, he makes an ar argument or, or a case that that's driving some of this vi gun violence in our country. And I don't disagree. You know, that's not to say that you don't have murders in the suburbs or in rural areas. Every one of our towns has had gun violence. Every one of them, and murders. Town of Brighton, during my tenure as police chief, we had two gun murders involving two young people. One was domestic related, and the other was a grudge. And the individual involved in the grudge, the victim in that, was trying to run away, and he was shot in the back with a shotgun. They were friends at the house, but it escalated kind of like what we saw in the book, out of control quickly. And that young man succumbed to his uh, injuries right away. As the police chief, I felt it incumbent that I go inform this young man's mother about what happened in Brighton. Not an easy thing to do. It had been on the news. She knew her son was friends with the individual that lived in the area. It was kind of a uh, secluded area in the town but nobody gave confirmation until I walked in with a group of investigators and gave her that confirmation. An arrest was made, a discussion about drugs came up, and that the person felt he was in fear for his safety. There was no conviction in the case. And I strongly disagree with the outcome that the jury made, strongly disagree. And I told the mother that. So. Let's take a look at what's happening around us. We have mass shootings here. Think back to 2020, September 2020, right? COVID, we're in the middle of COVID, or we're coming out of it a little bit. People are starting to gather. A group of young people gathered in the backyard, and I wanna make sure I get the, uh, the street right. Pennsylvania Avenue. It was a gathering, right? We were told at the time not to have gathering. We were told to have social distancing. We were told, we were told a lot of things. We were also yearning, we all were yearning for, for interaction. And a large party happened. And at this large party, two individuals that had a grudge with each other, or more, fired at each other. 40 shots, 40 shots were fired in, at this party. Two teenagers were killed, 14 others were injured. Anybody here on Twitter? I live on Twitter, right? My wife's like, get off Twitter. I, as a police chief, I would know what was going on in the town of Brighton before I'd get the, the command notification. And they're like, what are you, you live in a, you, a crystal ball? No, it, it's post, somebody already posted something on Twitter. You know, the author post, posted on Twitter. I've got a book coming out in January 2020. The Violence Inside Us is a deeply personal, ambitious exploration of American violence. 
and the biological historical roots of why and how we hurt each other. I look at Twitter to see what's going on. If I can garner intelligence information relative and pertinent to my current job, that's what I use Twitter for. I have the resources at my private sector ability, this national organization that we work, look, work with looks for the term leakage. Has anybody ever heard the word leakage before? Right? Adam Lanza, the shooter in Sandy Hook, right? So I'm, I'm breaking some of the tenets that I, I, I agreed that I would not mention or identify the shooters by name. But I think it's important here that we talk about them. He had some issues growing up. The parents, and I know there was a, a separation involved, live with a the mother. They had weapons in their home under lock and key that this young man was able to get access to. And ultimately, he went back to a school that he was familiar with. The shooter in the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh posted on 4chan. He made anti-Semitic, physical, and violent comments, what he was going to do to Jewish people. And back then, he was monitored by the FBI. At that time, the FBI saw those posts as being disturbing, something to watch, not actionable because of the First Amendment. Free speech. That's changed. Right? So I'll get notification from law enforcement of information that they received. I also have some data mining and data analytics capability through the private sector, this national organization. We have uh, FBI agents, Department of Homeland Security, all major executives that were in a different, they were in the Obama administration, and they created this organization. So I'll be alerted to incidents in Rochester. And we, we've had some situations that in the end turned out not to be what we thought they were going to be. Same thing happens now on a public level. There's a lot of violence, right? How many homicides this weekend? Two. How many people shot? Fourteen. There was a daytime shooting yesterday afternoon. Where are these guns coming from? And I'm not being critical of the Rochester Police Department. There's a lot of issues going on with the Rochester Police Department. To the best of their ability, they're trying to handle what is happening. I believe that. I also believe some change can and has occurred. What, what's happening? Where are these guns coming from? Right? If in New York we have these strong pre-purchase requirements, background checks or whatever, how are people ending up with guns? How many here have left your car unlocked? Do you live in Brighton? Okay, because I would have a conversation with you because we had all these crimes of being stolen from cars. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you're a legally a gun owner, but if you were, would you leave it in the glove box of an unlocked car? Does it surprise you that that's happened? Okay. Does it surprise you that there was an individual walking through one of our parks or the town parks and a gun fell out of his shorts and somebody stepped on it? Would it surprise you that that happened? Okay. So we're talking about the propensity for violence, how things get out of hand, we're violent, and the guns seem to be the common denominator. Well, how, how, can, we, how can we prevent that? Well, the author, who advocates for gun control measures, talks about a constitutional right to own gun owners, uh, to right to own and possess firearms, and in particular, handguns, right? If you're in Washington, D.C., you can't have a handgun, or you couldn't until the Supreme Court decision Heller. And I used to teach issues in constitutional law to people that were on a, a path to become law enforcement candidates, and we talked about constitutional policing, right? The author acknowledges that you have a constitutional right for gun ownership. You can't just throw that away. That right, he, he advocates, is revocable. If you do something, what, what can we think of? Prior criminal act? Mental health instability? 
propensity for violence outside of a handgun? Shouldn't these be factors that prevent you from owning a gun? We have that in New York State. We have something called the red flag law. You're a legal gun owner, you have an incident, and there's a mention of self-harm, and there's a mention of harming somebody else, that's actionable to revoke the pistol permit and, and, and seize the weapons. So the author talks about what we can do as a society, not a Republican, not a Democrat, what we can do as a society is, you know, adopt measures that will protect us in the long run. And I'll make the case, let's go back to that 10 year period. President Clinton, the anti-crime bill, and then it ended in 2004. Do you need the ability to shoot 75 rapid fire bullets? Do you need the capacity of a handgun? I don't know if anybody here is into uh, video games. There's a very violent video game where the, there's an extended magazine. The handgun ends here, and then another foot or a double coil of, of bullets, nine millimeter or whatever. I, I'm in, in favor of limitations. I'm also acknowledging that there is a constitutional right to gun ownership. But there has to be some type of responsible ownership. And that's what the author advocates for. So do you need those weapons that were designed for a military theater to be used or possessed in a non-military theater, right? In the book, the author talks about suicide and you know, he talked about the link to poverty. I'm also gonna talk about the link to those that served in the military. There's an epidemic of suicide amongst veterans. There's an epidemic of suicide amongst police officers, retired or current. That needs to be acknowledged. And what measures can you do to try to stave that off? You look for leakage, you look for indicators. This morning, when I was elevating my knee and watching TV at 4.30 a.m., because I, apparently you can't sleep when you get this type of an operation, a commercial came on directly focused to the veteran community that talked about the need to lock your guns, the need to have a gun lock, and then the commercial went on to talk about this measure can stand in between an act of suicide. First time I ever saw that commercial. You know, goes back to responsible gun ownership. So I'll end with this, programmed in some questions. The Mer Senator Murphy states, my hope is that my story, my awakening to the epidemic of gun violence in America over the last seven years is an invitation to readers, you're gonna go home and read, that's homework, to go through some kind of that same awakening. We need this country to be, what we need in this country is more activists. People are willing to go to the mat and become part of the movement. I don't disagree, I think, there's some measures that need to be adopted. So I've did a lot of talking. Anybody want to ask a question?